He said, if you're in judgment, you're not in me. If you're not in me, you're not in love. If you're not in love, why are you there? Because whatever you judge, you have no authority over. Only what you love, you have authority over. You've got to learn to steward your heart in everything. And I feel like I have a mandate from the Lord. I feel like I feel like the Lord has confirmed this. You know, it doesn't make any sense to me. And I'm just gonna talk. I can't be anybody than than who I am, and I'm so thankful that I don't have to pretend or be anybody else. So I'm just gonna be myself and I and I know that if God's called me to this, that it will bear fruit. But there's no natural reason for me to be standing here before you. It just doesn't make any sense. I, you know, I was, I was the most hypocritical person that I know. Um, and it wasn't that, you know, I, I was just in the depths of darkness. I was raised in a Christian family. I'd been taught the word. I knew, I knew stuff. And I was so hypocritical. And why I'm saying that is I want to say what you see in me or in any of the, of the others of us is the mercy of God and the, the love of God, the greatness of God. And, and, um, and I'm just so thankful that um, even though I was, you know, where I was, that sovereignly he just... He touched me, and um, he set us on this incredible path. And when I was doing my doctoral studies, um, I found out some things which were, which were really interesting. And I was doing it, of course, on orphan care because that's, that was my sphere of influence. And, and um, I didn't realize before this, even though I had studied the word extensively about caring for, for orphans, but I didn't realize the severity of the heart of God throughout Scripture on what he says about the church's responsibility to care for orphans and widows. I, I really didn't have a clue. What I thought was, I thought this was my calling and um, I was always hesitant to say this is super important because, you know, everybody thinks their ministry is super important. And I didn't want to be that kind of person, you know, that just said, oh, this is the most important thing and, and, and all of that. And, and I, but as I started digging into this and just going through from Old to New Testament, I really started feeling more and more of the fear of the Lord um, and I was realizing that there are some really foundational um, expectations that God has. And there are some, some things that are of great, greater importance to God than we think. And, you know, um, I'll give you an example. You know, uh, in the book of Matthew where it says, if you're presenting your offering before the Lord and you remember that your brother has something against you. Not even that you have something against your brother, but if somebody else has something against you, if you remember that there's conflict in relationship, first, put your hands down, go make things right with your brother, then present your offering to the Lord. And, you know, I think that for me anyways, I might have even elevated worship because I... I, I love worship so much. Uh, worship, when I'm talking about worship, like song and dance and pouring my heart out, um, even uh, above justice. And what I want to say is that what I want to show you today throughout the scripture is the severity of what God says about justice first throughout the Old and New Testament. And that... Um, if you look at the book of James, which we all know that's the most famous orphan scripture in the Bible, pure and undefiled religion, right? I just want to start by saying, as I started delving into this passage and looking at the original languages, I, I found out something interesting. And you guys might know this, but I didn't know it. And what the, the, what the passage 
um, is usually read, sounds like this, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father, which I think is important, true and undefiled, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and keep yourself unstained by the world. But as I was looking and as revelation began coming to me, I began to see in the original language, the way James originally spoke it, it reads like this, pure and undefiled worship. It's the word religion is the word worship. Pure and undefiled worship in the sight of our God and our Father is this, to care for, to visit, the word visit is the visit that is the way that God visited me when I was on the floor and his mercy came and it wrecked me and it changed me forever. I think sometimes that we think when, you know, we talk about visiting orphans and widows in their distress, we think about the common way that we visit people. Hi, how are you? You know, um, you know for kids, let's play a game, let's have a visit. It's not the kind of visit that James was talking about. James was saying pure and undefiled worship in God's eyes. And it's really important, isn't it, that we know what's important in his eyes. So pure and undefiled worship in the sight of our God and Father is to visit an orphan and a widow in a way that would make their life different, which equals keeping yourself unstained by the world. It's a, when you do this, you get this. There's no and. There's, it's not a two command scripture, visit orphans and widows and keep yourself unstained by the world. There's no and. It's an equal mark. It's when you do this, this is the result. It's a grace. It's one of the greatest discipleship, discipleship tools, I believe, that's out there. I mean, how many how many churches would love to keep their people safe from the world, you know, all in, completely whole in? And um, this, this um, passage was an indicator to me that I, there was more going on with this than I realized, and so that sent me on a search. And one of the first things, I'm just going to take you in this time that I have, um, I'm just going to take you through <laughs> through the Bible, and, and we're going to see what God says, and I have a point, and so bear with me for a little bit, and I really want to bring um, the word, because what I, what I find is that in my weakness, that the word of God takes care of stuff that I don't know how, so we're going to read a lot of the word, because it, it just cuts through spirit, spirit, soul, to soul, it just knows how to do that stuff, so we're just going to read a lot of scripture, so get your Bibles out and get ready. But the first thing that I found fascinating when I looked in the book of Genesis was, you know, how um, in the beginning in Genesis 1 that um, God the Father, God the Son, the, God the Holy Spirit were in the creation process. And every time that they created something, they stepped back and they said, this is good. This is really good. And they created something else the next day. And at the end of the day, they step back. And they're like, man, we did really good. This is, this is good. And they did that throughout the creation process. And on the, on the sixth day, when they had created everything, they stepped back. And they said, this is very good. And then we see right in chapter 2, we see something that's very interesting to me. And um, most people talk about this in relation to husband and wife, but I just think this is fascinating because it says that God, before the fall, before sin entered in the garden, when there was perfect fellowship, he looked at Adam and he said, it's not good for a man to be alone. Now, we know that Adam that God visited Adam in the cool of the night, right? They walked together. They fellowshiped together. So imagine this, in a perfect context, perfect, no sin, God, face-to-face -face fellowship every day. And God said Adam was alone. God said it wasn't enough that Adam just had God face-to-face. -face. Adam needed more than God. 
Adam needed not to be alone. He needed to have somebody on his, uh, of his kind with him, walking with him, living life, being in relationship with. And right after, I, w- I was just thinking about that, and I was thinking, man, because being an introvert by nature, you know, one of my dreams is just being alone with God. You know, I just want to get with God in, in a cabin somewhere, and, and uh, you know, that, that, that's glory, you know, uh, to me. And I was just thinking, God said that it's, it wasn't enough, that, that he would meet with, can you imagine every single day God coming down to you like not just here and not just, but like in a tangible, face-to-face, audible voice way, and it not being enough. Us having one another is so vital. And then right from there, I thought, I'm just going to look up the word orphan in the original language. And do you know what orphan means? To be alone. It means to be alone. The very thing that God said before sin, this is foundational. This is a foundational thing before sin that God said it's not good. We see every day in the lives of, and I want to talk a lot about orphans and widows, but specifically about orphans. And I kind of want to break some things off about the difference between, I, I heard over and over again, um, people all over in the States and in China, as I did my research, they would say, oh, yeah, um, we, we believe that, but we believe it's about spiritual orphans. And I do believe that, you know, obviously, I mean, we're evangelists. We're, we're in China, not just for babies, but we're in China to save the lost, to bring, bring lost souls in. And obviously, we believe in spiritual orphans, but... I think that we should not be foolish at all to think that it's okay with God to allow, I'm sorry if this is weighty, it's probably going to be, but I, I want you to know it's in love. <laughs> so, but, but I don't think it's, it's like we can't fool ourselves to think that it's okay for children to be experiencing what they're experiencing in orphanages all around the world, not only in other countries, in foster homes, in in places of placement, even here in the States, where kids are getting abused and tortured and, and, and sexually abused and physically abused. It's that we think that we can step over that group and minister to the orphan heart and not, not understand that God is a father first, and babies and children and, and those, those groups of people that have no voice and no say for themselves wouldn't be foremost on his mind. Any parent in here, any parent in here knows what I'm talking about. If I died, my husband died, my children were orphaned, and I had a voice from heaven, I would cry out to anybody And it would be the first thing on my mind. And I would cry out, anybody within the sound of my voice, go to my child. Make sure they have clothes and they have food. Now, I don't want to see my babies cold, without food, and without clothes. And that would be the cry of my heart. And I'm an earthly mom. And I want to show you in in the word The severity, and I'm going to bring it together, and and we're going to follow the scriptures to see the heart of God in this. So if you will turn to Deuteronomy. We're just going to look for a minute at who God says he is, and I'll go quickly. But, you know, God talks about himself quite a bit in the word, and um. This is uh, one that is consistently through the word, but I want to take Deuteronomy chapter 10. It says, um, chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, for the Lord your God is the God of gods. This is how he talks about himself. I love it. The Lord your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great, 
the mighty, the awesome God, who does not show partiality nor takes a bribe. I mean, he's amazing and big, and he wants us to know how great and how awesome and how powerful he is. But what does he do with that? Verse 18, he executes justice for the orphan and widows and shows love by giving food and clothing. I want to um, show throughout the scriptures that God, God is very practical. And the gospel is very, very simple. And when we practice the practical, simple gospel, all the stuff comes with it. All the signs and wonders and miracles, all the, that, that stuff comes with that. But, but the, the practicality of God and the fatherness of God can't be overlooked in his desire to make sure that people are not cold and hungry and alone. If you would turn with me to the book of Psalms, Psalms 37. And I just want to read just the first part of 28. And it says, the Lord, our God, loves justice. He loves justice. When I first got wrecked by God, I realized that I didn't know anything about him. Not really. I knew the scriptures, but I didn't know his heart. And so I would sit in my chair every day and I would say, God, I have to know what you love. What do you love? Now, remember, I'm not a, naturally a kid person. It's not that I, I love children, but you know, like you see people who are just really, really anointed with kids. I wasn't that person. Like I, I, um, I was tender towards children, but it wasn't my gifting. And every time I would get before the Lord, I would say, God, show me what you love. He would show me faces of children. And uh, over and over and over again. And I began to realize that God really, like, it's not just something that we hear about, but God really, day and night, he hears cries. Like, he hears literal cries for, um, from children, and that the cries of children can cry out for us or cry out against us. And I remember being at an orphanage for the first time, and I'm just, I'm going to say some things. I just know I honor even my Chinese government, I love them so much. They're, I have close friends now in the Chinese government. But I think unless you know what's going on, it's hard to understand. And it's, it's maybe easier to not, um, to not see. And so I remember going into the orphanage for the first time. And I remember it being eerily silent. And there were rows and rows of rooms of babies. And like, I don't know if there was 100, maybe like 80 babies on the baby floor um, lined up in like um, uh, 10 different rooms and in steel cribs, and nobody was crying. And I've, I, I said, what's going on? But there's this front room in the front of the orphanage, and that room, the babies were crying. And so I asked the IE, I said, why, why are none of the babies crying except the babies in the front room? And she said, she, and she didn't even blink about telling me. She said, oh, she said, those are the kids that are just abandoned. And she said, they're really upset because their parents have abandoned them. And so they're crying. And so in this room, we only give them food. Um, we only give them food and we'll change their diaper, but we will not hold them. We won't pick them up because we want them to learn that their voice has no value. This is demonic. This is the opposite of who God is and what he wants for his children. And she said, and so once they figure it out, and she said, they all do. They all do. They boasted to me so many times. I would be in the hospital um, with a child having surgery, and, and some people from the orphanage would be with their kids having surgery, and they would say, oh, and our baby is just chucking a fit, man. She's just screaming her little head off. She just had surgery, not pain medication. You know, they, they do things differently. And... Um, and our baby would just be crying, and we would just be comforting. And I would say, our babies don't cry. And, 
you know, boast about that. Our babies don't cry. They know that they're not going to get their needs met when they cry. So they learn that their voice has no power, and they just stop communicating. And I remember seeing this little baby. She's like this, this big. And this in the very beginning when they wouldn't let us do anything. They, we were mocked so much um, in the beginning. And, and we were trying to figure out how do you follow God's voice how do you do what you know God's told you to do and honor the government at the same time? How do you do that? And, and we didn't know. We were just figuring out, but God knew, and we would pray, and, and he would show us things. And, and so I would go, and I would, I would hear, you know, stuff going on, and I would go to the door, and I would say, can I come in? And they would say, no, you stupid woman. You know, you're full. I mean, they you foolish woman, of course you can't come in. You're a foreigner. We, we don't let you into our orphanages to care for our kids, you know, and they would, they would laugh at me. They would, um, I, you know, I would be standing there and not knowing what to do and be trying to say something, and, and they would literally turn their back to me as I was talking. And I, you know, what do you do? I, I don't know. I was just learning. And so we went home and we prayed and said, God, what do we do? And first of all, honor is really important. I'm so thankful for what Bill and Bethel have taught on, on honor. But, but honor of authority is really important to God. And it would have done me no good to be dishonoring of them, not only with my words, with my actions, but in my heart to dishonor them. What I needed to do is I needed to figure out how to serve them. And in my service to them, God opens doors. And so we just, I mean, simple. This stuff is not rocket science. It's so, it's so simple. We, we said, okay, well, what do we do? And we notice in the Chinese culture that they bring fruit, you know, to people's homes when they want to show um, gratitude. And so we would bring the IEs fruit. And we would, if we saw garbage outside of the door, we would pick up the garbage. And, and I noticed there were so many kids with cleft lip and cleft palates. And so we had cleft lip, cleft palate bottles sent from the States. And, and we just, you know, I gave them to him and I said, if you want to know how to use these, because I'm a speech language pathologist by profession before I moved. Uh, and, and so it was one of my things uh, as I worked in a neonatal unit um, prior to uh, the call, this, this, what I'm doing now. And, um, and so I had some experience um, with that. And so we ordered bottles, you know. So the gift of serving, the gift of giving, the gift of honoring, and the gift of waiting. We waited. We waited. We positioned ourselves in, in humility as much as we could. And we had to fight feelings, you know, of, of being angry or being judgmental or, you know, like all the things. Like when you're, when you're faced with injustice, if you're not feeling offended, I don't know that you're far enough into the darkness because the, the darkness should be offensive. It should be an offense, not the person, but the darkness should be an offense. And so we had to, to figure that out and work with God in that and how to honor the person but hate the sin and, and to go after destroying the works of darkness. And, um, and so when we, we would go home every day. Um, this was not a long period of time. I, I believe that God is not slow. I, the, word, the word says he's not slow. He's patient unto salvation, but he's not slow. And I, so I just tell God all the time, I don't want you to have to even be patient for me. I want to run as fast as I can run to keep up with you. So the, the, you, we don't have to wait. I think that these long times of waiting, um, I, I do believe in waiting on God. But I don't believe in long times of waiting. I believe he moves us to, from glory to glory, and he opens door after door after door. He wants the lost saved more than we do. He wants the orphans comforted more than we do. He, he wants this more. than So why would he wait for something that's needed? He's ready. So we just position ourselves and say, okay, okay, God, we don't want you to have to be slow because of us. And, and so about two weeks went by. All we knew how to do was pray. 
All we knew how to do was worship. And can I tell you, it's enough. It's enough for any call. So we just went to our little apartment. It's not big. You know, we're just like you. Just went to our little apartment, got on our face, literally, before the Lord, and said, God, open the doors. If this is you, confirm it with power. Open the doors. And about two weeks went by. Oh, and he gave us Proverbs 21.1, which I love. It's a life verse. You know, the, um, the kings of the earth are like water in God's hand. This is the gist of it. Whichever way he turns his hand, the water flows. You know, the government, when we first went there, seemed so scary to me. There, one of the, the principalities is like control and oppression. And so when, whenever we would meet with the, the PSB or, you know, the people in authority, um, it, it, it wanted to, be, to make me intimidated and it wanted to scare me. But the Lord gave us this and he said, Dina, they're just water. They're just water in my hand. Whichever way I turn my hand, it, it, it can't go in the opposite way. It has to go in the direction of my hand. So he just said, turn your hand in the direction of the kids. We know that that's what he wanted to do. We weren't begging God. We were coming into agreement with what he, with what he already wanted. And, and so two weeks went by and we get this. Um, no, I was at the orphanage. And I heard this little girl crying, itty bitty. Itty bitty, premature, itty bitty little thing. You know, her, her skull was still so soft because she was so premature. Her little legs just dangled. When I, I held her in my hand. But I wasn't allowed to hold any babies at that time. They just said, okay, you can come in now, but you can't hold any babies. Because they didn't want babies held so that the babies didn't cry. And so, um, and I had to be okay with that. You know, this is another thing. Like, I couldn't go in and just break down in tears. And I wanted to inside what I saw as a mother broke my heart. But I couldn't go in and show that in front of the people that were extending to a certain extent trust to me. They actually opened the door and let me in. And it was important that I stewarded that trust and not made them feel like they were awful. And so, I, and I would say, oh, God, I don't know if I have the grace. Like, I remember walking up the stairs, and because I, I've seen probably some of the most horrific things you could imagine being done to children. And, um, and I said, I don't know that I can do this. And he said to me, Dina, you asked me what I love. And he said, I showed you. And then he said, you asked me if you could come with me. And I extended you the invitation. And he said, I hear them. He was real sweet to me when he was saying it. I hear them day and night. They, the sound of their voice is, he was very serious, never out of my, my hearing. I hear them day and night. And if you want... You can come with me, and my grace is sufficient. I saw, I remember walking up the stairs, this conversation, you know. These little conversations we have with God are real important. And so I just said, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this unto the Lord. And this little girl was crying. She was hurting. She was sick. She was dying. And I watched the, the staff, you know, she was itty bitty. And you know, like a little baby, like you're always afraid how you pick them up. You, you know, if you've had a newborn, like, you know, like you don't want to pick them up rough or, or anything. And, and I watched them as they grabbed this little, this little preemie by, by one arm and pick her up. And it was her one, you know, once a week they get a bath. And so they took her naked, and of course, it was a baby. You know how their hands and their feet go out, like in that, you know. Um, and, and so she's screaming, and, um, and I'm watching this. And they're, they're taking her, and they take her to a cold bucket of water, and they dunk her in a couple of times and take her back out, throw her on the table. 
And there's not even a thought that this is wrong. There can't be judgment on the person. Their father is not my father. They haven't learned the things that I learned. That's why I'm there. The Lord spoke to me one time. And, you know, silly things you can sometimes get offended by. I remember nobody follows rules in China as far as driving. You know, it was like, oh, my goodness, it's complete chaos. And nobody stops at red lights. And, you know, I'm sitting at a red light. And... And I'm the only one stopped at a red light following the sign. The only one. Everybody's racing past me, you know. I'll, and, and I'm saying, ah, you know, God, why doesn't anybody do what's right? And he said, Dina, he said, if you're in judgment, you're not in me. If you're not in me, you're not in love. If you're not in love, why are you there? Why are you there? Because whatever you judge, you have no authority over. Only what you love you have authority over. You've got to learn to steward your heart in everything, in everything. And so uh, one of the things that I, I'm really, really trying to learn and really serious is not just, you know, about how quickly I can close my mouth, but the conversation that goes on in my heart about all people because it's impossible to curse to curse our brothers and sisters and love God. It's just, it's just impossible. And so the things that we say in our heart set us up for success or for failure to have an impact or to go home early. And, and it wasn't easy. And, you know, I, I hope I don't make it sound easy. It was a process. And, and I had to learn a lot. And we had to repent a lot um, for for the things that he would show us, and he would show us, you know, um, I didn't just come for one, I came for all. You can't just love the prostitutes, Dina, you gotta love the pimps. I remember bringing my, so off note, but bringing my beautiful teenage daughter that God had just cleaned up as she was abandoned at our gate, just cleaned up and, and filled with the spirit, and I told you the story, she was the one, that, oh, you know, that one, and and I uh, brought her on this. She wanted to go on the streets to minister to the prostitutes with me. And um, the pimps and the johns were circling her. <sighs> you know, first my mama heart came out. And, you know, which it should, which it should. Um, but also the fear of the Lord. And he said, you have to love them all. So I just protected her with my body and made sure that my heart was right so that I had an impact. And I did have an impact with them. And, and um, side note, so uh, you know, this, the, I, I'm just trying to give you a picture because when we, when we read scriptures about setting the captives free, um, releasing um, the yoke, you know, breaking every yoke. Um, uh, people in, you know, in, about visiting those in prison, uh, you know, about all of these things. I think sometimes we don't understand that the most marginalized group, in my opinion, are orphans. They, they, they fit every one of those categories. There's not one of those babies that I knew that could crawl out of their crib and leave the orphanage. They were completely dependent on the people that were there to give them whatever they were going to get for that day. They were the most oppressed, the most bound. The, 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 out of all the people that I've ever ministered to, I've never seen such bondage as what the enemy has tried to do to the children of God. And it's just such an injustice. It's such an injustice. And... and so I remember this, you know, this little girl, and she's crying. She's screaming her head off, and, and, um, and the, the nurse is being rough. And, and now this is after now weeks, maybe months. I don't, I don't remember how long, but of, of serving and praying and blessing and all of that. And, and I said, I said, and I had formed a relationship with one of the IEs. And a little relationship, not, not super strong yet, but a little bit. And I kept coming back. And so that spoke to them. And, and, um, and I said, can I hold her? And she said, yeah, go ahead. And um, I remember I picked her up. And before 
I knew what was happening out of my mouth. And I'm a woman that, like, really stewards her words because I just really believe that um, our words are super powerful. And so I, I try to think about the things that I say and say the things that I'm serious about. And so after, I, I, I wasn't even thinking, but I picked her up and I said to her, I'm going to take you home. And as soon as I said it, I thought, how am I going to do that? Because they've already told me that I'm not allowed to have any children. I mean, think about this. It makes perfect sense. I was a foreigner who had only been in China less than three months at this point on a tourist visa. If we had foreigners come into America, we would not let them go into our system and grab a child out and take them into their home. So, you know, it might sound like the government was being cruel, but I can understand these laws, you know. It seemed crazy to me when I started asking for children. It seemed, you know, it seemed so outrageous and so crazy. and, And so... Um, I, but I said to her spontaneously, I'm going to take you home with me. And so I didn't know how I was going to do that. So the rest of my time I spent holding her, I was praying in the spirit. And um, thank you, Joseph Garlington, for talking, not this time, but times before, about the power of praying in the spirit and just reminding, I'm telling you, I'm giving you strategies in the middle of the talk. They're simple strategies, prayer, worship, praying in the spirit, fasting, foundational things that never grow old, that you never outgrow, that are so valuable. And I'm so thankful for the gift of praying in tongues because there's so many times I don't know what I'm doing. And it's and I know that I can pray the heart of God without understand without even having to understand. And so I'm praying in the spirit and finally they take her away from me. And I can't show emotion. You know, I can't, you know, it's it's not the time. So, you know, take a deep breath and go to the leaders who have already mocked me and made fun of me and and all of that and said, you know, this this little girl literally dying, like like within days she would be dead. She was gray. Her her brain was bulging out of her forehead. They put them in these little troughs, their heads in these in these steel cribs and these little wooden cross a uh, cross that they make. And um, so that the babies can't turn their heads from the left to the right because they don't hold them when they feed them. And so what they do is they cut off the top of the, the nipple and so, because a lot of the babies are too weak, too sick, too premature to suck, swallow, breathe. And so they cut off the top of the, the nipple. They put their heads in this trough so that they can't move their head and the milk flows into their mouth while well, most of them can't swallow. And so you hear drowning. I, saw, I, I can't even tell you how many children that were there one day and gone the next. I know because they're, they aspirated that it was, I'm, I mean, it's part of my training too as a speech pathologist. And I would just go in and hear silence and hear gurgling. And the parts that they did get in, they just put a towel around their neck and... Um, that the towel was to catch the vomit because the babies weren't lifted up to burp or to anything like that. And so, so um, it's demonic. It's demonic. And it's, and it's happening right now. Millions, not, not a few. Every year in China, a million babies are abandoned. Only 7,000 are adopted. The rest spend their lives in institutions and they're not, they're not kind institutions. And that's just China. That's just China. So, so I go to the, the government and, and we ask for her. And they say, no, absolutely not. You know, stupid woman. <laughs> You're, who do you think you are? And no. And we said, okay, you know, thank you for, for giving me the appointment. Went home, talked to God. And got on her face and, and prayed and cried out to God. And um, in that process, about a week into praying for her, it was time for us to go to Hong Kong to renew our visas. We had been in China for three months. And um, it was time for us to go to Hong Kong to renew our visas. We thought Hong Kong was just like mainland China. We didn't know that it was the fourth most expensive city in the entire world. And so, and mainland China is very inexpensive. 
And so um, during that time, um, there was credit card theft that was going on and um, that we didn't know about. And so some friends of ours that we had made said, you know, you're going to Hong Kong to get your visa. They said, um, don't bring cash with you. There's a lot of pickpockets. And, um, and so they, they recommended bring enough cash to get to the hotel. And when you get there, go to the ATM, take money out and, you know, use that for spending. And so we said, okay. And so we did that. And we brought about 400 renminbi with us. And, you know, a taxi in, in our cities, about at that time, 50 renminbi, you know, to go from where we were in the village into the city. So we're, you know, thinking about the same. And we get our kids in the taxi, three kids, eight, five, one and a half, and get our kids in the taxi, don't speak a lick of Chinese yet, don't, don't know anybody in Hong Kong, get to Hong Kong, get in a taxi, get to the hotel, and um, the, the taxi driver said, that'll be 400 RMB, please. And we said, okay, well, wow, that was expensive. And so we, we had the money to pay for the, the taxi, went into the hotel, and we, we had been able to book the hotel with a credit card, but you can't pay with a credit card, or at that time you couldn't, only with a Bank of China, which we didn't have, we only had a visa. And so we could hold the room on the visa, but we couldn't pay the room with the visa, we could only pay with, with a uh, Bank of China card. And so, Mike, oh, they let us check into the room, me with the three kids, and Mike went to find an ATM. We didn't realize, for any of you Chinese people out there, that it was May 1st. And May 1st in 2005 was a national holiday where all of the banks, all of the government offices were closed for a week. And not only that, but all the ATMs were shut down because of this credit card theft that had been going on. So... There was no way to go to the ATM, and there was no bank that was open to get money. And we knew nobody, and we had no money, and we were in Hong Kong. And my kids, I remember my kids were crying. They, I mean, they were little, you know, your kids don't, don't, they, yeah. They, they were crying, and they were hungry. We didn't even have a bottle of water to give them. And Mike came back, and he told the the hotel staff first, they said, we'll give you 24 hours to be out of the hotel. Um, and if you, know, if you can't pay, we'll give you 24 hours and you need to be out of the hotel. And so Mike came up to the room and told me right behind him was this little man that came to lock the mini bar to make sure that we didn't steal any water or food out of the mini bar. Now, you have to understand, I was this, I mean, we could have, in our former life, we could have paid for anything. We could have bought what we needed for ourselves, and we could have blessed you. And now I'm sitting here in this hotel room, we have given everything we had away, and sitting there, and I can't even feed my children. I can't give my babies a drink of water. And, and I'm new. You know, I'm not a seasoned missionary or a seasoned pastor or anything like that. Just Mike and I are brand new. And, and so he went for a walk like he does when he needs to pray and think. And, and I went into the bathroom because I didn't want to make my kids afraid and them see me cry and, and pray. And so I did that. And Mike came across this Christian bookstore. It's a long story, but I'll just give you the gist of it. Um, we had, right before we went to China, we had been in Africa. We really thought we would be in Africa long term, but the Lord called us to China, and so we had spent some time with Heidi and Roland. So Mike stumbles into this bookstore and, this, and starts talking to the owners of the bookstore, and they are friends of Heidi and Roland in Hong Kong, in a little Christian bookstore in Hong Kong, and they're, and they're talking, and, and he's asking questions and finds out what's going on. Well, of course, you know, they they blessed us and they, you know, they paid for everything and, and it was, it was beautiful. It was wonderful. Um, and such an answer, you know, to, to our need. Um, but the, the woman before we left, she handed us this book and it was from the house of loving faithfulness. And it was about children 
that were in Hong Kong like 60 years ago. And these two missionaries from England 60 years ago that came when, when children with disabilities were on the street and kept in cages. And these women would go and they would unlock cages and they would take in like five or eight kids was all the two of them could handle. And, and so they would take them out and they would treat them like their own and, and they would love on them. And, um, and so she, she said, I believe that this is why you're in China and this is why this has happened to you. And so she just hands this book to me and I start reading it. And um, I know that I know that I've heard this invitation before. I know as I'm looking, it was page after page of pictures of children, pictures of people with, with all kinds of disabilities, no arms, no legs, um, all kinds of, of disabilities, special needs, and, um, and their story. And we didn't go to China to open an orphanage. We didn't go to China to take care of kids with special needs. We didn't know why we were going to China. There wasn't, there wasn't a plan. It was just we had gotten touched. We felt like we prayed into it. We fasted. We waited for confirmation. And when we got it, we went to China. And when we got to China, we prayed. And, and so she's handing me this book, and I'm reading it, and I'm feeling the invitation. And I'm thinking in my mind at the same time. And I'm thinking, this is what God's calling us into. And I'm thinking, I got scared. And I thought, Okay, I know me as a mom, as a woman. I know that the first child with a severe disability that I take in, I know that that, that means that I could never send that child back. And if I couldn't adopt that child, that means that my whole life would be given to this. And, and I knew that, you know, as much as I loved people, I knew that it, that it would be that it would be different than what I thought to take care of somebody as they got bigger and wiping bottoms and wiping jewel and all the, all the unlovely things that, that we don't always think about. And, and I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking, God, I don't know that I have this kind of love, but I know that you do. I know that you do. And, if you, and I, I know that it's silly for me to pray this, but um, I needed not just to hear it in here, but I needed to hear the rhema. I needed to hear his spoken word. I said, if you promise me that you'll never leave me, I'll never say no. And I just felt peace, you know, and I felt like he was saying, I promise. It was, he wasn't offended by it at all. I just felt like he was saying, I promise I'm never going to leave you. And we fly back into China, into mainland China, this was Sunday, Saturday night I prayed this prayer. Fly back into China Sunday morning, get a phone call, and these three missionaries, are not mission, these three Christian women from a village town outside of the city found a little itty-bitty baby, uh, and he was just a hot mess. They found him in the mountain roads. People, it's a known fact that where we are anyways, if you leave a baby in the mountains, that they're going to be eaten by animals, and it's a way... That, that people are able to abandon their children without getting caught because it's against the law to abandon your children. And, um, and so this child was left on the mountain road with the intention of, of not making it. And these women said that when they saw, came up on the baby, they heard the voice of the Lord and the Lord said, this child is important, don't let him die. So they picked the baby up, and they took the baby home, severe, cleft lip, cleft, la cleft, lip, cleft palate, severe brain disorder, severe heart, could not tell if the child was a boy or a girl, ambiguous sex, blistered head to toe, born too early, still had his umbilical cord, and um, could not eat, could hardly breathe. And so they're trying to keep this baby alive for three days. They took him to every orphanage that they could find. Every orphanage said, no way, he's too severe. There's no way I'm, that we can take him, just let him die. And so, but they had heard God's voice. And so we flew back into China and they had been fasting for three days. We didn't know what was going on with them. They didn't know what was going on with us. They talked to somebody that morning and they said, well, we can't help you, but we know this couple, and maybe 
you know, we heard that they'd been visiting the orphanages. Maybe they would help. And so they call us and they said, um, we have this baby. Will you take him? And we said, of course. And we had, you know, we had nothing. I remember Mike having to scramble to the store to buy, you know, to buy a crib and, you know, just all of these, all of these things. And, and not too long after that, we get this knock on the door and, um, just through the door. He was so small. There was no clothes. There was nothing that fit him, no diaper, anything. His, he was just, I mean, so, so super tiny. So they hand me this baby and I open this towel. And seriously, guys, it was like I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't, you know, I, I, was, I was preparing for the child. I wasn't expecting the encounter. And, and as I unwrapped him, it was like, unwrapping Jesus is all I can say. It was one of the holiest moments that I've ever had. And, and I thought to myself, I remember just standing there holding him, all the fear, all the insecurities that I had before the cross, all the, all the stuff that was coming up melted away. And I thought to myself, I was made for this. I'll do this the rest of my life. And then I thought, Oh my goodness, God, you knew me better than I knew myself. Never, I was 35, never had a clue that I was made for this. And God knew me better than I knew myself, and he gave us this little package. Well, there was still, so we, we got this baby and had no identity, um, no, no birth certificate, no proof of his existence. And um, so we had to bring him to the orphanage. Now, the orphanage had already told us that we couldn't have the other baby, remember, the, di- the little dying girl, that we, couldn't, that we couldn't have her and take care of her. And, and so um, I have to call them and say, I have this child, and I, I, we don't know. Are they going to take him away from us or not? And... Um, and then there's this other little girl that we've already said that we wanted. And they said, Absol-, first of all, they said, absolutely, it's against Chinese law. You cannot foster a Chinese child. And they said, more than that, not even Chinese people foster more than one child in a, in a family. So there's no way you're getting multiple children. And we said, okay, so hang the phone up, go get on our face and pray not long, I don't even, less than a week later, get this phone call, you can have the baby. And get this other phone call, you can have the baby. And the Lord, the, and the Lord gave us these, these two amazing little preemie babies. And I feel like I'm supposed to tell you this. Um, We, we were supposed to name her Faith. I, we, we pray about every child's name. And we, we felt like the Lord said, you know, we feel like we're learning how to hear God's voice. We feel like the Lord says name her Faith. And that kind of gave me faith because I thought if the Lord calls her Faith, he's going to heal her. She was very, very, very sick. When actually when they ended up calling us to tell us that, that we could take her, they said, She's so sick, she has a a form of meningitis that's contagious, and it could kill your whole family. And so, do you still want her? And, you know, and and the first thing I thought of was my mom and dad. Believe it or not, I I thought, you know, how, how hard it was to take their grandchildren away from them, and how hard it was. You know, it's, our family loved each other fiercely, and my kids loved their grandparents, and their grandparents loved them, and how hard that was. And I thought, God, what if you ask me to do this, and it means the life of my children? And then I thought, but if I prayed, and you opened the door, that even if worst case scenario, I know that everything is going to be okay. And so we took the baby. You know what I've learned as far as fear is concerned? This might not be a great strategy, but it might help somebody. I don't know. But, you know, I hear a lot of people say, you know, like, 
talk, talk really in denial about things that could happen. And, and I've seen so many amazing, amazing people that go through stuff, including ourselves. And we don't know what's going to happen. And so when the enemy tries to bring me something that's a, that makes me afraid, that, that has real validity to make me afraid, like, you know, my kid's dying or, or, or things like that, that have real, you know, that could really happen, um, I found that I look at it. I look at the fear right in the face, and I say, worst case scenario, all will be well with my soul. Because I don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. And I don't know what the Lord will do in my life. I trust him. I trust him. And I know that he could do whatever he wants. And it's going to be for my good, for my family's good, for the good of the world. Even if it doesn't look good in my own understanding, I know that it will be good. So um, that's the strategy that I use. Instead of just trying to, you know, I just look at it and I say, okay. You're trying to make me afraid with this. I'm telling you, I'm standing right here saying, no matter what, my soul is going to rejoice in the Lord. My soul is committed to my Father. My soul knows that my God is good. So if that helps somebody. Um, So this, this little girl, she is raw from her, from her, the top of her diaper to her knees because they change diapers twice a day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon or nighttime. No matter when they go potty, they change once a day. So the acid from the, from the feces and the urine eats their skin away, especially the itty-bitty ones. And so she looked like a peeled plum from, from here to here. And um, we didn't even know how to bathe her, you know. And here we had now, we have our three kids. We have this other little guy that was brought to us. And he seemed like he was dying. I mean, we're praying. We're fasting. We're praying. We're seeking God. We're doing everything we know how to do. We're tired. We're trying to homeschool our kids. It's crazy. And... Um, and, and so we, we, we're holding her, and she's just so little. And, and, of course, she screams just trying to clean her, you know, when she needs to be cleaned. And we prayed over her. And within three days, no, no joke, no exaggeration whatsoever, I opened her diaper on the third day, and she had completely new skin. Completely. <laughs> completely. Three days. Completely. And, I mean, we, we, we couldn't believe it. I called Mike. Mike, we were looking at her diaper and, you know, rejoicing. It was, you know, a miracle. And it gave us so much faith because she had so many other things going on. But a couple of months after, three or four months after we got her, she, she, seemed, she was thriving. It seemed like she was doing amazing. And um, she got sick one day and just stopped eating. You know, one day. And you know when your kids don't eat, that, you know, something's going on. And so I said to Mike, something's going on. She won't drink her bottle. Um, if she's not better tomorrow, we need to take her in. In China, they don't have, like, doctor's offices. They, you go to the hospital. So um, that night she wouldn't eat. The next morning she was just not looking well. So we called a friend of ours to take us to take me to the hospital with Faith. Mike was staying home with the kids. And um, so I went to the hospital with this baby. And while I was in the taxi holding her, um, she stopped breathing. And um, I jostled her and, you know, just thought, what's going on? And jostled her and rubbed her. And I said to my friend, um, Danny, I don't think she's breathing. He was a medical student at the time. And he leaned forward in front of the taxi and he looked at her. And all I remember, like I remember him screaming to the taxi driver, get there, the baby's dead. And we weren't close to the hospital. And so I'm dry, we're driving and driving and praying and praying and pray, praying in the spirit. I don't, I don't know how to do this. And I believe everything that I had been taught. I believed 
all of the Bible now, I've been trained to know that our God is the God that raises from the dead, that heals the sick, that ca- you know, all of that. But I'd never held a dead baby before. And I didn't know what I was doing. And, and I remember getting to the, the hospital and getting to the emergency room and running in. And they wouldn't treat her because she was an orphan until I put money into the account. And so she's not breathing. And I'm by myself with translator. So I'm having to run to the money counter to put money in and come back and give them a card before they'll start trying to do CPR on her. It just, you know, did this. Did, she was so tiny, every bone in her chest broke. I'm watching this, and now she's mine. You know, there's something supernatural that happens like there's no difference between my adopted children and my biological children um she's my baby now you know and so I'm watching this happen to my daughter and Mike's not with me I'm by myself and I don't and I don't know what to do and I'm trying to remember everything that I've been taught and And now, by this time, the whole emergency room is filled, hundreds of people filled watching this white woman with this dead baby. There's no curtains, no nothing. And and they're watching, and they're watching me. They say she's dead. And I, I pick her up, and I don't care now who hears what or if I get kicked out of the country or what my goal is to raise this child from the dead and so I was like praying in the spirit I was you know I and I was saying out loud God I don't know how to do this I don't you have to teach me right now you have to teach me right now as I don't know how to do this every scripture I could remember hovering over a baby's body I mean I, I went through them all I tried them all and she didn't come back and Mike wasn't there. And I didn't know what to do. And not long after that, this guy, I remember to this day, he was like in swimming shorts and a medical jacket. He came like with a cart. Uh, like it looked like a hospitality cart. And he pulls right up to me, room full of people staring at me. I'm crying. I'm still praying. I'm still believing. I'm still, you know, like I'm not done praying yet. And and they said, put the baby on the cart. And I said, mm-mm. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and, and they said, put the baby on the cart. And I said, my husband's not here yet, and, and he's going to want to see his daughter. And so could I please wait until my husband gets here? And so they were impatient, but they agreed to let me. And I just held her so that nobody could get a hold of her and take her away. And I just held her, just praying, praying, praying. And Mike finally got there. I remember when he came and took her from me, her body was already rigor mortis had set in, and her, she was molded to my shoulder. And he just took this little baby and prayed and prayed. And this, you know, this beautiful father, you know, that just poured his heart out and did everything that he knew to do. And she didn't. And she didn't come back. And, and so they said, you need to put her on the cart now. And I said, could, could, you know, it just, it just didn't seem right to just put her on a cart and send her off. She was holy. You know, even though I know she's dead, if she's dead, she was with Jesus. I know all, all the things. But, I mean, you wouldn't do that to your child, right? Like, we would have... We would have something awesome for a child that passes. And, and so it just it seemed like more injustice, and, and I didn't want to do it. And I said, could I carry her to wherever, wherever you're taking her? And they were upset with me, but they were like, yes, you know, yes, you can. So they take me out of the hospital room, out of the hospital in the middle of summer, down a dirt road to this little shack which was the morgue. And I remember, th- I remember thinking to myself, this isn't happening. Like, this isn't happening. And, and, but I'm walking. <laughs> I'm saying this. 
and I'm praying. And, they, and we get to it, and the door is locked. And they said, oh, the person's not here. Lay her in the dirt. <laughs> and I did not want to lay her in the dirt. I did not want to do that. And I'm asking God, what, what do I do? And he said, it's okay, Dina, lay her down. I said, I've got this. I've got this. You know, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. But he was, he was so with me. And um, left there and went home, and I remember the orphanage had told us there was a lot of political stuff that was going on between China and um, the United States at the time. And they said, if a baby ever dies in your home, not only will you never get another child, but any children that you have will be taken away from you. And so I'm going home and thinking, we have Caleb, this other baby. And are they going to take him away? And he was sicker than faith. And is he going to die? And, you know, kind of like these swirlies were going on in my head. And, and I was afraid. I felt afraid and um, confused. And I went in my house. And I didn't want to go in the bedroom where, where Faith had been. Her and Caleb shared a crib in Mike and I's room so that we could watch over them in the middle of the night. And, and I didn't want to go in there. It just was painful. You know, it was painful. And, and I didn't want to hold Caleb, which was strange. But it was, it was like there was, a, there was fear. And um, I sat down in the rocking chair that Mike had bought us to rock the babies in. And I said, um, God, I didn't come here to bury children. I came to raise them from the dead. And, and I don't want to do this. This is really, I mean, I've heard about this before but this is really 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 hard and I heard him very clearly he said to me the only thing he said Dina will you still believe and in that moment I knew what he meant I knew that he meant will you still believe that I am the God that raises from the dead will you still believe everything about me even though you haven't experienced it right now, will you, will you set your heart on that? I knew what he was saying, and what do you say to God? Just cried and said, of course, of course I believe, of course I believe. And I knew, as with everything, I needed to do word and deed. Like, there's something about saying and declaring, but there's something even more solidifying about putting an action with your words and and so I went into the room where Caleb was sleeping, and I picked him up, and I put him on my shoulder, and I said, I, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. And that's all I could pray. I believe, I believe. And God comforted me. And a year and a half later, now we have, not only did they not take Caleb away, they said, you know, we when I called the orphanage to tell them what had happened to Faith, I, was, I didn't know what to expect, but I was crying. And, um, and I try not to cry just because it's not kosher, you know, there. It's, it's not the thing to do. And, and so, but I, I couldn't, I, you know, as I started telling them what happened and just telling them I'm sorry, I just said, I'm, I'm so sorry, you know, that, that, sh that she died. And, and, and you trusted us with her, and, and, she, and she passed away. And, and um, a couple of days later, we had already asked for five more kids before this had happened. And a couple of days later, we got a phone call, and they said, we were talking about how much you loved the little girl that just died, so we're going to give you five more. Everything, you know what I found? And I know that you guys know this. I know that you know it, and I know I'm not saying anything that, that you don't already know, but... The enemy really tries to make us afraid of things that actually the opposite is already in motion. Like he, he tried to make me afraid that even the one was going to be taken, but the plan of God was already that there would be multiplication. And um, we've seen that just so many times uh, that... 
that now we have more faith when we hear things and, and see things that we, we say, okay, we know exactly what's going to happen, but that took time. But a year and a half later, the Lord woke us up. We have many babies now. We have a home now for children. And, and the Lord woke us up and said, go to this orphanage. There are kids that are dying. And so we'd never been, didn't have a relationship with this orphanage. Um, and this doesn't happen. You, can't, you know how long it took me to get into our city orphanage? That, that the doors would be open to another place, it, it doesn't happen. But, but the Lord said, get up and go to this orphanage. The children are dying, and, and, and I want you to take them home. And so out of obedience, we drove four hours to get to this orphanage. And I don't really even say much besides just nice greetings to the officials there. But the first, I just walked in and I said, which ones are dying? That's what Tom told you. Which ones are dying? And just very nonchalantly, she said, oh, that's easy. This one, this one, and this one. And I said, can we take them? And she said, yes. Just, just, that, e just that easy. You know, I, I take that really serious because I know how many people have a heart to do what I'm doing. And the favor is from God. And, and there should be a fear of the Lord <laughs> with that. And so um, we take these kids home with us. And this one little girl, she's a year old and she's seizing nonstop. She's never been on seizure medication. And I mean round the clock, nonstop seizures, shaking violently, um, you know, just, it was just awful to see. And we were all praying. Brenda Jones had a team. Um, there's a lady uh, in the audience um, that was, that was uh, at our house um, when we brought Rosie home with us. And, and uh, she's shaking violently. She would have to sleep right next to Mike and I so we could keep a hand on her to see if she stopped breathing so that we could resuscitate her. And I, I hope you know, like, we're praying the whole time. We're, and we're seeing, we're seeing measures of miracles, but we're still seeing a lot of sickness. So both are going on. And, and so I have our hand on her, praying for her this one day, and the team's there. And um, I was holding her, and I remember um, all of a sudden she stopped breathing, and um, immediately, it was like the enemy, this heads up, like I think he takes pictures of our hard times, of our, of our times of discouragement, and he saves them for, for moments. And so I, he had a picture of me in the taxi with Faith. And immediately, it was like, that was, the, that was what I was seeing. It was not a God vision. It was a demonic picture. And, and I thought, and she looked when she stopped breathing, just like Faith. First she stopped. She turned blue. She turned black. I remember her eyes started to dry out. And there was no life left in her. And, and I'm... I've got this picture, and, and, and I'm thinking, this is exactly what faith looked like, and it made me afraid. It made, and, and so and I, I'm holding her, and I'm pacing, and I'm praying. Everybody in the room is praying, and I'm pacing, and I'm, and I'm saying, I don't know if I said it out loud or not, but in, internally I'm saying, I don't want to do this again. I, no, 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 I don't want to. And I started crying. I, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to do this, and I love this child, and I don't want to do this, and, and I don't know what to do, God. Tell, if you would show me what to do, if you would tell me what to do, I would do anything, but I don't know what to do. And all of a sudden, I saw like this picture, a quick vision that I thought I saw of a hand come right over the taxi and just kind of... Just sweep it away. And I heard a voice say, you said you would believe. And I remember, I was like, kind of perked up a little bit. And I, you know, I was holding her in. And all I knew to pray was, I believe. I believe. So I'm praying. I believe, I believe. 
Nobody knows what's going on inside of me. It just, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. I believe, I believe. Everybody's praying. I believe, I believe, I believe. Lay her down on the sofa. And it's one of the times where I, I felt the gift of faith, which is the coolest thing in the whole entire world. And I wish I had it all the time. I so wish I had it all the time. But I knew. And I said, in the name of Jesus, breathe. And at the word, she went, <gasps> pink dried up. Since that time, and I don't know why, I just, I feel like I'm supposed to share this with you, and I had all this other stuff, but since that time, I held, I've held 29 babies, dead babies that didn't come back. And we are contending. In fact, I was just with David Hogan, and I got an impartation. And let me tell you something about impartation, okay? You get an impartation, and then you have to go home and you have to steward it. It doesn't just hop on you and happy to stay with you and give you a ride. It doesn't work that way. You steward the impartation. It is a gift, a glory, holy gift from God. So many are going to receive impartation tonight. And I'm telling you right now, you are going to have to go home and you are going to have to contend. And you are going to have to learn what to do with disappointment. You're going to have to learn how to, how to steward your heart. Breakthrough will happen. We're going to see all that we want to see. I totally believe that it's in the book. I totally believe that. But you, like, there's so many people that want me to pray that what, what I have that they would get. And, I, and I'll, I'm happy to pray for, for that transference of grace and, and, the, and, the, and whatever. Whatever God wants to slide over to your plate. I'm happy to do that. But... But you have to steward it. And it's for the greater glories. It's, it's not easy. It's not easy. But it's so worth it. It's so wonderful. And one of the things that I can say is that the, the death of a child is very holy. I've never been in more holy, a more holy atmosphere than when our whole family not just my immediate family, but our whole family, where we are, our Chinese family, were gathered around a child that had passed on. And we had prayed. You know, some kids, we pray for days until the government takes them away from us. You know, uh, uh, and, but there's, there's something so holy about being in that, about changing their clothes, preparing them, uh, and worshiping God and standing on what you know is true in the face of something that seems so contrary to that. I don't know. I, I'm so thankful. And I'm telling you, too, there's grace. Like, don't ever think that there's not enough grace. I remember the strongest rebuke I ever got from the Lord. And I'll close with this because my time is almost up. And I'm sorry I didn't get to the biblical teaching. But next time. <laughs> next time. But I remember walking up my stairs. This was after years of being and doing what we're doing. And, it, and we were tired. Like no sleep. And nobody at that time to help. You know, it's kind of like starting a business. You, you got to do all the work at first before you see. And I mean, there was no help and little help. And, um, and I was exhausted. I just, we had four premature infants in our bedroom day and night. Um, and so around the clock, Mike and I fed and clothed and, and all of that. And, and uh, I was walking up the stairs. And we don't have elevators. We have um, five-story buildings, several multi-level buildings and no elevators. So get my stairmaster. You know, it's good exercise. Um, but we walk up the stairs a lot. 
And um, I was walking up the stairs, and I was kind of muttering and just just telling God, which wasn't very smart, I guess, um, how how tired I was. And I, there's a way to tell God that you're tired and a way not to tell God that you're tired. <laughs> and I think this was obviously the way not to tell God that, that I was tired, but I was just, I started out just talking to him, but I, I shifted into complaining. And the mistake that I made was I said, I felt like, I said, God, I, and I was carrying a big load of laundry. And, and I said, I feel like there's no grace. And seriously, I got, like, it was one of, one of the only times I can remember I felt the anger of the Lord. And I think it was because of the Holy Spirit. I don't know. But he said, don't you ever say that there's no grace. Do you think you could do anything without my grace? Do you think you could be climbing these stairs without my grace? Do you think you could got your head out of the bed this morning without my grace? Do you think you've done any of this? Silly one. Do you think you've done any of this? And I am like, I remember freezing on the stairs and just repenting and saying, I am so sorry. I knew that, but I forgot that. You know, I knew that, but I forgot that. My point in that is saying, his grace is sufficient for any call on your life, for any impartation that's going to happen, and not just for your little family. He wants to save and heal your little family, but for the world. The, the power of God inside of every one of us is enough to change the world. The grace is there, but we're, it's a journey and walking it out, and it's little steps by little steps by little steps that, that take you into these incredible, amazing places. And I could, you know, just tell you so many stories. I remember, you know, not being a kid person and thinking, I mean, we were literally kids now in China, in a small village, in this hidden little village. Nobody knew what we were doing because of you know, we, because we were in China, too, we weren't allowed to openly communicate and to even share our needs, our spiritual needs and all of that. All of our phones were tapped, and, you know, there was all kinds of stuff going on with, with the government. And it was, it was just a... It's just a, a crazy, it's a crazy learning time. And I just, I, I would, I hope that, um, that as I stand up here, that I would be an encouragement because I'm so normal and just, very average, you know, in my natural giftings. I can't sing. I dance crazy. You know, I, I you know, A, B student, not brilliant, just normal. But I've seen God, you know, 24-7 babies and think, what about the rest of the world, God? What about, you know, my heart for the prostitutes? And what about our heart for the drug addicts? And what about our heart for the, you know, all of that? And, and we're just 24-7 babies. And you know what started happening? It didn't take very long. But all of a sudden, the prostitutes started coming to our gates. And it's not that we didn't go out. We always go out. It wasn't that we didn't go out. We, I mean, we prayed on the streets for four years, prayed, prayer walked, prayed, contended, um, before we saw our first miracle and first healings with the prostitutes and the pimps and all of that. But, but as we were sitting there with the, with the babies, college students started coming, 6,000 college students to our itty-bitty little village, our itty-bitty little house in this itty-bitty village. Last year, 6,000 university students came. The government, people from Beijing on down, they said, We've heard about you for years. We've read about you. We had to come experience in person. Government officials coming to our house. Underground church, government church, 
homosexuals. All of these people now just coming, coming to the Father's love. And we now, as we, you know, as we are faithful to take care of these kiddos, it's, it wasn't the end. It was the beginning. It, he, I just feel like he, he really, really likes. He really, really likes it. He's really, really pleased because he really, really loves justice when we take care of what's important to him. And one of the things that I just saw in the scriptures was time and time and time again. And next time, you know, I have to give you the scriptures. But I was amazed at the times that God says, especially in the Old Testament, like all of the things that he had said that he wanted as far as the offerings that were being brought to him, you know, the burnt offerings, all, all of those things. And he would say, you're bringing me these offerings. And he said, I hate your offerings. I hate your festivals. I hate your Sunday morning services. I hate your worship services. I hate all of these offerings you bring to me because you've neglected the orphan and widow. You've neglected justice. And he said, first, bring to me this and then bring to me that. He, you know, he's a just God. It, it's not right that, that there would be so much rejoicing when there's so much suffering that, that is just, you know, kind of overlooked. And, and so I just really feel like what Lou Engle is speaking right now is I feel like he is probably the most important man of God on the planet right now. I, I really do. And what, what, what he's doing. But, but he, you know, what he's bringing in sacrifice, through a sacrificial life and, and talking about Roe v. Wade and talking about adoption and saying the answer to Roe v. Wade is adoption. The answer is adoption. And just before I quit, I know that, that some people would say, well, I don't know that I feel called. There comes a time when there is crisis where it's not about calling. It's about doing what's right. It's not about calling. It's, you know, like when what happened in Las Vegas happened, it wasn't like, oh, do I feel called? Everybody in the community came, gathered together. When, when there's crisis, it's, it, it's not going to be fair. It's not going to be just. I shouldn't have as many children as I have. It's not right. It's not the way God intended it to be. But somebody has to do it. Somebody has to do it. And, and so... Um, I would just want to put out in the atmosphere that, you, that we as a church would, would start thinking what, what we can do now because it, statistics show that it would only take 6% of people who claim to be born again. These are born again Christians, not just Christian, born again Christians. Only 6% of born-again Christians to completely wipe out the entire population of orphans on the entire planet. It's not a pipe dream. It's not a pipe dream. People tell me all the time, well, the, the word says that there'll always be the poor among us. It says that, but it doesn't say that about orphans. It's not God's intention for Jesus to come back for his pure and spotless bride while there's orphanage orphanages filled with children that are are being sexually abused that are being tortured that are being you know all of this stuff that's it is not that I can't I can't imagine that that would be what he steps back into I really believe I really with all my heart I believe that this that there's a shift coming where orphans around the world the, the church is going to run. The church is going to run. We're going to empty them out. And the world is going to see this, and they're going to they're gonna see this, and they're, the signs and wonders that we demonstrate, they're going to have so much more effectiveness. They're, because there's, not, there's nothing hypocritical 
you know, about it. I was sitting on the airplane with a woman, and she was telling me all, all the reasons that she, you know, the things that she had against Christians and how, you know, hypocritical that, that we are. And she talked about all the dying children around the world, and nobody's doing anything. And she looked at me, and she said, well, what do you do? It's so perfect. And I watched her hard heart melt. I just watched her hard heart melt. And so I'm just saying, I would like to give, I would like to present to my mothers and fathers of the faith and to the church something to think about. Think about this, that it's more than do I feel called. But in the book of Titus, it says, Paul says, 314, I think it says, that we, the people of God, must learn how to meet the critical and pressing needs of our time so that we will not be unfruitful. <laughs>